Thanks for listening to this archive of Teaching American History's last Saturday webinar for the 2020-2021 school year. The focus of this episode, the last in our Remember the Ladies series, was Sandra Day O'Connor, the first female United States Supreme Court Justice. We were joined as usual by Dr. Chris Burkett of Ashland University and Dr. Eric Sands of Berry College and Dr. Josh Dunn of the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our final teachingamericanhistory.org Saturday webinar of this academic year. These web, uh, webinars are sponsored by the Ashbrook Center at Ashland University. Uh, TAH.org is the leading online resource for the documents-based study of American history, government, and civics for teachers, students, and citizens. My name is Chris Burkett. I teach here at uh, Ashland University, and I'm director of the Ashbrook Scholar Program for undergraduate students here. So this, uh, this spring semester, our theme uh, for our webinars has been Remember the Ladies. And in case you happen to be joining us for the first time, let me that, just point out that our purpose is to bring together some thoughtful scholars and have a lively conversation. Um, and we encourage all of you joining us today to participate in that conversation by submitting questions uh, via the Q&A function, not, not the chat function. We'll be looking at the Q&A function, so please Submit any questions that you have, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. In the next week, you'll receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from today's program. So today we're talking about Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. And to help us think about her, we uh, welcome Dr. Joshua Dunn of the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs and Dr. Eric Sands of Berry, Berry, Berry College, sorry. Uh, so thank you both very much for joining us this morning. Um, let me start with a, a kind of broad question, uh, gentlemen, if you don't mind. And that is, um, you know, we've looked at, uh, we had six slots this, this, uh, this webinar season to look at, uh, at six ladies. And we've talked about some very important and influential, influential ones. Uh, Last uh, month, we talked about Fannie Lou Hamer. We've talked about uh, Susan B. Anthony and others. So the sixth and final slot is Sandra Day O'Connor. So do you mind telling us why uh, each of you think that she is worthy of, uh, of consideration and being up here in this sort of uh, you know, pantheon, if you will, of, of important uh, female historical figures? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, Thanks, Josh. The, Thanks. Yeah. There. I think I can think of a few reasons. First, of course, is that she was the first female justice on the Supreme Court. Um, so uh, for that reason alone, she's going to be of importance and worth, worthy of uh, some serious uh, consideration. Uh, but then I can think of a few things during her tenure on the court that make her of historical interest and significance. Uh, so she played uh, a kind of moderating role on the court. She was a swing vote uh, on the Supreme Court for most of her time uh, while she was there. And so if you were to look at sort of the, the ideological camps on the Supreme Court, you would have a kind of conservative block uh, and then a liberal block. And then in the middle, you would have Justice O'Connor and then Ju Justice Kennedy. Uh, but I think it's interesting to compare her to Justice Kennedy, who was, uh, as I said, was the other swing vote while, while they were on the court. Uh, Justice Kennedy, you wouldn't you wouldn't call him a moderate. Um, instead, he seemed to be uh, he, he was a swing vote. Uh, but wherever he was, he tended to be on the more extreme end of it. So if, if, if he was joining the the liberal bloc, he'd actually sometimes move farther to the left than than the liberals and the conservatives. He'd move farther to the to the right than the than the conservatives. Where where O'Connor really was more of a, a centrist. Um, so I think that leads to a third consideration: what was her actual judicial philosophy? And this is something that I, I actually have trouble uh, putting my finger on. I, I don't think that you can say that she had a well-developed um, theory of constitutional interpretation in the same way that you think of someone like a, uh, a Justice Scalia with originalism or a Justice Brennan with a living constitutionalism. Uh, she was something of a pragmatist. Uh, and I think you can see some of that with the cases that, that we uh, are looking at today and, and discussing today. And it sometimes leads to contradictions uh, that are difficult, I think, for her to, her to reconcile. Um, 
the final thing that I would say about her, her jurisprudence is to the extent that I think of there's a, a consistent theme throughout it was that she was an ardent defender of federalism. Uh, but it's difficult to locate what that, the, the uh, a kind of distinguishing uh, opinion of hers uh, on federalism would be. It's, it tended to be that she, she voted consistently or very often consistently to defend the authority of states. And that came, I think, from her background. You know, she served in the state legislature in Arizona. That gave her great sympathy for the difficulties that state legislatures sometimes faced when confronted with com commands from the, from the federal government. So I, I, that also is something that when I think of Justice O'Connor, I, th I think of her defense of the states, but it's rooted again, I think, in her, her experience in practical politics. Yeah, that's very interesting because she's, I think she's sort of remembered by a lot of people as a conservative, as part of the conservative block. But when you look at her, her opinion, she really is, she could go either way or, or yeah, come up with yeah. her own con you know, uh, concurring or, or dissent. Uh, Opinion based yep. on her own reasoning about things. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric, agree? Yeah, uh, no, I absolutely agree. And and you know, I, I think I think you know some scholars have noted that there was a a bit of a shift in her jurisprudence after her cancer diagnosis and treatment. Uh, that she, you know, perhaps became more assertive, um, began uh, to embrace more of that role as the swing vote. Uh, you know, sort of maybe came out of her shell a little bit more um, and, you know, was maybe not quite as aligned with that conservative block, uh, was more willing to go her own route. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, if, if she has a judicial philosophy, it was, as she described it, incrementalism, um, that she believed you shouldn't make big changes um, in the law uh, based on a lot of cases. It's one thing that brought her into conflict with Scalia on numerous occasions who thought everything should be based on principle. You know, you lay down a judicial principle and you apply it to a particular case and that's what gives direction to lower courts um, and to legislators uh, about what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. And that wasn't really O'Connor's approach. Um, you know, O'Connor seemed to take these small marginal steps um, that didn't rock the boat all that much that would leave open the possibility that these cases could be brought up again and new decisions could be made based on the facts of a particular case, which, you know, may, maybe has merit, may, maybe doesn't, uh, you know, I, I, that's part of, I guess, what we'll discuss today. Um, but, you know, the other piece for me is, uh, you know, for women, she was sort of the George Washington of the Supreme Court. Um, she set a lot of the precedents for how women were going to exercise the office of an associate justice. And that was a lot of pressure on her. Uh, I mean, people really don't appreciate, um, you know, the, the, the stress and, the, and the, the, the pressure that was put on her, not only as a, as a female figure, um, but also carrying the burden of the women's movement, which she didn't fit neatly into. Um, I, I recall a speech she gave before, before a women's group uh, shortly after she became an associate justice in which she, uh, she introduced herself by saying, I'm here today in a dress with my bra on. Um, and that was, <laughs> you know, that was her way of sort of saying, if you're expecting a radical feminist here, you're going to be sadly disappointed. <laughs> That's not who I am. You know, I, I believe in women's rights. I believe in gender equality. I, I think we have, you know, certainly, um, you know, miles to go in, in bringing that about, but you know, I'm, I'm not in the radical camps. And I think she carried that through to a lot of parts of the way that she conducted herself on the bench. Uh, she just wasn't given to extremes. Uh, she, she was sort of you know, cut right down the center. And I think it sometimes really tried to, uh, you know, bend over backwards to try to find a centrist approach through things. Now, I mean, there were flare ups, certainly. Uh, I think the Kalo decision <laughs> is one of those flare ups where you see her uh, digging in very deeply and uh, getting really worked up. Um, over what she sees as, a, as an unconstitutional violation. But um, for the most part, you know, his, her decisions are, are quite modest. Um, they avoid intemperate language. She always tended to avoid taking digs at other justices, even when they would take digs at her. Um, and, uh, but I mean, just in terms of how she conducted herself, uh, you know, she was, 
she was the belle of the ball when she, you know, came onto the court. I mean, was invited to all of the best social events and she attended all of them. Uh, there was a famous story about John Riggins getting drunk um, and asking her to dance. And before she could accept, he passed out on the floor um, in front of her for about two minutes. And she, you know, she doesn't get flustered. She laughs it off as a humorous experience <laughs> um, and even tells the story in future events uh, that, that happens. Riggins, of course, is very embarrassed about the entire thing. Um, but uh yeah, I mean, she just carried herself with dignity and, and charm and grace. I mean, it didn't hurt that she was an attractive woman. Um, and, you know, how to, how to use that to her advantage and have that not be a disadvantage, I think, was something that she, she struggled with at times. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think a remarkable woman in many ways, but not easily categorized and not easily pegged in a, in a particular camp. I think you're muted, Chris. Sorry, just for clarification, this is all really fascinating. You are you talking about the running back? Yes. John Sorry Riggins? about that. Yeah, yeah. John Riggins is the running back. If there aren't any football fans or uh, you know, Washington, whatever they're calling themselves now, fans. Um, so this is all really fascinating. Josh, again, either of you, please feel free to jump in at any time when you have thoughts. So I, I had the pleasure of teaching um, for the first time uh, a constitutional rights course this semester to my undergrads, and this is this is. Uh, Clearly not my strong field, but I, I learned it. But it, what, uh, as, as I went along, but I, we read a lot of opinions from both Scalia and O'Connor in this course, and all the things that you're saying, Eric, are really ringing true to me. So S Scalia is known for his sort of biting sarcasm and his, you know, jabbing other justices. He won't name them by name, but he'll, you know, insinuate, you know, who he's talking about. So and criticizing. And you're right, Scalia. Uh, I'm sorry, O'Connor is very measured and and even and uh, and reasonable uh, in the way that she writes. And the other thing that reminds me of your your point about O'Connor not getting carried away with making radical changes. Um, I, I, we read a couple of cases in which she was she would either she would concur with Scalia, uh, but but not. But Scalia, but Scalia was uh, always looking, it seemed to me, for any opportunity to, to restore uh, a court precedent to the common law tradition or the, found, you know, the original intent of the founders. And, and, and so O'Connor, sometimes in her, in her separate opinions, would come to the same conclusion in the case, but, but not want to go quite so far in terms of, sort of in, you know, turning back the clock or something like that. And I was wondering why that was, because I, I always sort of thought of her as an originalist, originalist of sorts. Um, but the way you're, you're both explaining this now makes a lot of sense to me in terms of her being very measured and, and you know, these sorts of things. Yeah, I, I wouldn't call her an originalist. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't see much, much evidence of that. Uh, <sighs> There, there are these stories uh, uh, about their time on the Supreme Court, particularly you know, when Rehnquist was the Chief Justice, uh, and there, where where Rehnquist would have to try and rein in Scalia because they would have a conservative majority on a on a decision, and uh, Scalia uh, was was annoying O'Connor, <laughs> and so so uh, <laughs> so Rehnquist would they actually heard from a. A friend of Scalia's, an attorney who's in a friend of, a friend of Scalia's, argued many cases before the Supreme Court where, where, where Rehnquist would send send a note uh, to 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 Scalia saying, "Nino, knock it off! You're pissing off Sandra again." Uh, that, so uh, um, that was part of what you know. But that gives you an, a sense of her 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 power on the court too, as as a swing justice, uh, she could defect right from the coalition. And you know Scalia's acerbic wit uh, would would sometimes, and it would sometimes be directed at her, <laughs> or quite often be uh, be be directed at her. And she, of course, didn't like it, but she was, it, but she was a Supreme Court justice with with one very powerful vote, and she was she was willing to exercise that vote in the way that uh, she wanted to. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, the 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 relationship between those two, I think, is going to as. Uh, as their archives become available to scholars, I think it's going to be interesting to see what kind of other interesting things show up about how particularly Rehnquist was trying to manage that relationship. 
Yeah, that's there fascinating. Was apparently an in, there was apparently an instance where uh, uh, Rehnquist warned O'Connor uh, that Scalia was preparing a particularly biting dissent um, that was going to take her to task for something she had written in a concurrence. And her response to Rehnquist was, well, I guess I'm one of the boys now. Um, and <laughs> I thought that was a, a, a great response to it. Um, you know, for her, it was, well, you know, he kind of does this to everybody. Um, so, I, you know, it just, this refusal to take it seriously, the refusal to take it personally, for the most part, I mean, I'm sure some of it had to have gotten to her, but, um, you know, I, I think everybody on the court experienced that with Scalia. So it wasn't anything where she was being singled out because she was a woman. Scalia was like that with everyone. Um, and, you know, uh, in a way, I, I guess you might even say she was maybe a little flattered that he was treating her the same way as everyone else, uh, not sparing her because she was a woman. Um, but, you know, one of the things I always recall, though, with O'Connor is that, you know, she didn't have a whole lot of judicial experience before coming on the court. Um, you know, as Josh pointed out, her biggest experience was as a state legislator, and she ascended to the rank of majority leader um, of the state Senate. Uh, so she was not just a legislator. She was a very powerful legislator who was in charge of building coalitions, um, building compromise. And I think she carried those ideas with her um, as she entered onto the court uh, in her book, uh, The Majesty of the Law. Uh, she writes about uh, you know, the history of the Supreme Court. But, you know, interestingly, her most admired chief justice is Justice Taft, which doesn't usually come up <laughs> as among the most admired chief justices <laughs> in American history. <laughs> um, but what she admired about him was that during his tenure, about 83, I forget the exact number, but it's like 83% of the opinions issued by the court were unanimous. Um, and she really liked that about his tenure, that they were able to build consensus and the court was able to speak as, as one voice. And she thought there should be more of that on the contemporary court, uh, that the court should be speaking uh, more unanimously and should be speaking with larger majorities. And so she saw herself, I think, as a consensus builder um, and trying to find ways of getting you know, the left and, and right sides of the court to, you know, to moderate and compromise. And in many instances, they had to do that because of her. Um, you know, the, the opinions had to be toned down to get her support, um, or they risked losing her. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. This is good stuff so far. So, so we've got some questions coming in now. So maybe before we turn to some of the, the opinions uh, from Justice O'Connor, uh, we'll take a couple of questions. And again, I'll just remind everybody joining us: please feel free to submit questions in the Q and A feature. Uh, so everybody can see them. Um, so the first question was from he actually there are two questions from he. Um, I'll start with his second question. Speaking of the relationship between Scalia and O'Connor, was there ever a position that you you felt uh, that either of them took just sort of to spite the other? Or maybe spite's too strong a word. Yeah, I can't <laughs> I can't think of one where the but there could, I think there were cases where, um, particularly on Scalia's part, some of his language was a little more aggressive <laughs> because he thought that uh, O'Connor just wasn't getting it. <laughs> and so, it, uh, and maybe he expected, so maybe Scalia expected her to be able to get it in the way that some of his colleagues on the left. Um, or more clearly on the, the liberal block. You know, well, for, for Scalia, of course, there's just no chance that they were gonna ever be persuaded, but O'Connor was, and so I think it really did frustrate him uh, when, <laughs> when, when, when she would defect right? and, and, and not agree with him. So, that, I, I, so I can't think of a, of a case, uh, although again, once, they're, once their files opened up, we might very well might hear about instances where you know, they, they did vote a certain way simply because the other one had had annoyed them su uh, sufficiently uh, to do it. Go ahead, yeah. Eric, I'm sorry. Please. I would be very surprised if we found any evidence that one of them took a, I mean, I, I think it would be very surprising if O'Connor ever did that. Maybe a little less surprising if Scalia um, ever did it. But again, I, I would be personally very surprised to find any evidence that that, that ever, ever occurred. Both, both of them deeply loved and respected the law. 
and were deeply impressed about the importance of Supreme Court decisions. And I don't think either of them would have wanted to tarnish a Supreme Court decision by personal animosity or, or personal spite. Um, so I, I think they always spoke from principle or, you know, Scalia certainly speaking from principle, O'Connor speaking more from compromise or moderation. Um, but, uh, you know, Scalia could put a little extra venom on it um, at times. I think that's what he did when he was trying to, to dig in and, and make a, 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 you know, a sharp point. Um, was he put a little extra sting into the, uh, uh, into the opinion, but I don't think he ever took an opinion uh, just because he was trying to spite O'Connor. I've seen opinions from Scalia where he goes, uh, where he's critical, not of O'Connor personally, but of the doctrine or the precedent that she might be invoking uh, as the foundation for her opinion. He'll sort of be critical of that, of that doctrine, if you want to call it that, but, or that principle. So. Yeah, and, and one of his common complaints was that she came up with, with solutions that were just going to be unworkable in practice. Mm -hmm. They weren't going to have any longevity. They, they weren't going to be able to sustain um, themselves over time. And I mean, in, in many cases, I mean, I think there was some validity to those criticisms. Um, and we're going to see some of those things bear fruit over time. Um, but, you know, that being said, um, how he phrased those things uh, could sometimes maybe overshadow uh, the strength of the critique. So yeah, so you can see, I, I, you know, Scalia's famous line was the rule of law is the law of rules. Uh, and if you read O'Connor's decisions, uh, it's, she, she of course uh, loved the rule of law, but I'm not certain that she thought that the, um, uh, that Scalia's emphasis on clear rules uh, was, uh, as justified as Scalia th thought, it, thought it was. Um, she was more than willing to have a lot of, I, I think a, lo a lot of uh, gray area in, in the doctrines that she was kind of articulating. And so again, I, I think that you see that, uh, for instance, with the comparison between the Hawaii Housing Authority versus Midkiff decision and her dissent in Kilo versus uh, New London. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, it's difficult to divine a clear standard there, uh, even though she's obviously very upset about what happened in New London. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you both very much. So uh, the other question from Heath was, it seems like Justice O'Connor was always attempting to defend her opinions by creating a scenario or recreating a scenario in her mind that then she asked, then she asked whether the founding fathers would have, would have agreed with it. Is it flawed to apply modern day questions to the thought of the original founders, uh, in part because, as he writes, the founders would not have allowed her the position she held on the court? So this is a little bit broader question. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. It's legitimate to think about what the founders uh, would have thought. I mean, after all, they expected the constitution to change. Um, that's why they included an amendment process. Right? So it's there. So it's not just because society has changed doesn't mean that the principles that are articulated in the constitution don't have contemporary application. Uh, they, they, of course, fully expected. In fact, if they didn't, then what's the purpose of a constitution to begin with? Right? Uh, um, the reason you have one is that it can, uh, it can apply uh, in, fu in future circumstances. It can't foresee every single thing that's, uh, that, that you can imagine. That's why it's not like Hammurabi's code. It's a statement of general principles and, and rules that then can have to be applied to new and unforeseen circumstances. So yeah, it's, it's certainly fine to think about what the founders would have said about her particular interpretation of, I don't know, the Fourth Amendment or the First Amendment or the, uh, or the takings clause. Thank you, Josh. That's a very thoughtful answer. And I know that was shifting gears a little bit. It took us to the, to like the higher, <laughs> the higher realm of, uh, of thinking about this, but it's a very thoughtful way to think about it. So, um, Adam asked what qualities of O'Connor led Reagan and his people to nominate her to the Supreme Court? Uh, what kinds of arguments did they have amongst themselves in picking her over other choices? And what did uh, Reagan think about her um, her opinions and her decisions. Do we have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, 
I mean, she was on the short list um, early on, I mean, she wasn't really a, a shadow candidate that popped in at the last minute. Now, of course, Reagan had announced during the campaign with Carter uh, that he was going to appoint a female justice to the Supreme Court. Uh, and so that was a, a promise he had made to the American people, and he made it very clear to his subordinates that he intended to fulfill it. Uh, the hard part was figuring out who exactly they were going to appoint because there weren't a lot of females uh, on the federal courts. Uh, the ones that were there, uh, you know, it wasn't so clear that they were right of center. It uh, wasn't clear that they stood on the right side of Roe v. Wade. Um, and there was a view among some of Reagan's uh, appointees that they had become institutionalized, uh, that they had become too acclimated um, to uh, to the judiciary and wouldn't stand independently enough uh, to cast uh, uh, informed votes uh, the way that the administration would like to see them done. Reagan personally was, I mean, blown away by O'Connor when they met. Uh, he loved the fact that she was a Westerner um, like, like him. He loved the fact she grew up on a ranch. He loved the fact she grew up relatively poor. Um, and, you know, had to work from a very young age, knew, had a strong work ethic, had made her own way in the world. Uh, he liked the fact that she'd experienced adversity. Um, of course, she graduate, graduated very high in her law school class from Stanford, couldn't get a job out of law school. Um, the, the only job she was offered were secretarial jobs. Um, her husband was able to get a job at a pretty prominent law firm, but she was not. And so, you know, she decided to make her own way in the world. Um, and it, that, as it happened, that way ended up leading into politics. Uh, but she co-chaired Barry Goldwater's um, campaign uh, in Arizona uh, in 1964. So she had the Republican bona fides. Uh, she had, you know, the, the conservative bona fides that he thought, you know, was, was needed. She had the Western sentiments that he really liked about her. He also found her personally charming um, and a really you know, wonderful human being. He liked her devotion to family. Uh, the fact that she had remained you know, a, a devoted wife and devoted mother to her children, uh, despite all of her career uh, aspirations and, and uh, the things that she wanted to accomplish. Uh, so I think all of those things fit in quite nicely. Um, and he thought she was in the right place on row. Um, and that was that was the big point of contention um, when she was appointed was where where is she on Roe v. Wade? And when he asked her point blank about it, she said, I personally find abortion abhorrent. Um, now, that doesn't mean I'm going to find it unconstitutional. <laughs> Um, but Reagan was satisfied with that answer, and he put out his feelers to especially the Christian right, saying, you know, she's one of us, don't worry about it, it's going to be fine. They were very skeptical, though. It took quite a while to win them over on O'Connor, um, and just as it took quite a while, and the, the left was never really won over um, by O'Connor, even though she did pass the Senate unanimously, um, but uh, it was, I mean, as all judicial confirmations are, it was a very political process. Uh, they had to lobby a lot of people in Congress or in the Senate um, to get support for. She had to go make the rounds with the senators and was very effective at winning them over individually um, to supporting her. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of it was her own doing and a lot of it was the support that she got from Reagan, but um, he was he was satisfied with her. Uh, as for her decisions, at least early in her tenure, I think he was generally happy um, with the decisions that she made. Uh, I mean, nothing really stands out as being a, a big black mark on her record for him. Um, I think he probably you know, would have been a little more disappointed with some of the later abortion decisions that she signed on to, but, um, and, and certainly some other uh, civil rights questions that she he maybe signed on. Uh, later on after he was after he was gone. But, um, you know, I, you know, especially compared to like a David Souter. Um, <laughs> I think I, I think Reagan was probably pretty happy with what he got in O'Connor. <laughs> yeah, so there's actually an interesting backstory on her nomination that then affected Souter's nomination. The person who was responsible for investigating O'Connor for the Reagan administration to see whether or not she'd be a reliable conservative vote on the court was Ken Starr. 
Ken Starr. And so he was the one who was doing all. And so then it turned out that she wasn't as reliable as they thought uh, she was going to be. And so then when Justice Brennan retired and they were looking for a replacement in the Bush administration, Ken Starr was he, he was on the short list. Um, but there were members of the legal team in the Bush administration who said, well, Ken Starr, he's not he, he's not a reliable conservative. And they had two pieces of evidence for this. Uh, one was the way he wrote. They said he writes like a liberal. He has all this flowery language. That was actually what they said. So you can't trust him, right? It's kind of purple prose or something. But the second was, well, he didn't do a good enough job investigating O'Connor. Um, and uh, she's turned out to be a bit of a disappointment. Uh, and so they ended up, but so they ended up uh, with David Souter. <laughs> instead of instead of Ken Starr, there really was going to be a revolt on on in Bush's uh, uh, staff if if they had nominated Ken Starr, which is fascinating oh. to, to consider in light of the you know of course the Whitewater investigation and every uh, everything since. Um, and I will say this is something interesting, right? right? So conservative presidents had been they'd been worked up about Supreme Court justices ever since the fifties. Uh, and they've been trying to figure out a way to identify people who would be reliable conservative conservative voices on the court. Uh, you know, uh, Eisenhower was asked uh, what his biggest mistakes as president were, and he said they're both sitting on the Supreme Court. <laughs> he was talking about Earl Warren and, and William Brett, and so that shows you that even you know what twenty some years later they still hadn't figured it out. Right? <laughs> um, they didn't get someone who was going to be as consistently. Uh, conservative as, as, as they wanted. So I do think Reagan was disappointed, particularly on some of the, the, the decision, you know, the, the, they had chances to overturn Roe versus Wade. O'Connor joined with, of course, Kennedy and Souter in a very decisive opinion in Planned Parenthood versus Casey upholding it. Yeah, I think Reagan was, uh, was disappointed there. And I think he was still, you know, his, his mental faculties hadn't declined um, you know, that was, uh, what, 1991 or so. So I think that he, he, he would have been disappointed by that. Yeah, that's fascinating how these things work out, how, you know, what goes into these appointments and, uh, <laughs> and decisions. So, and I think you also, by the way, uh, both of you answered uh, Laura's question, which was as, uh, as a Reagan appointee, was she, was she expected to be more conservative? And then how much resistance did Reagan get for appointing her? So I think you answered that question, unless you have something to add to that. But I think, I think I think, that. There's no, a I, mean, I, I, I think oh, it ahead. depends on what dimension you're you're measuring it on. I mean, Josh is absolutely right on abortion. I think Reagan would have been disappointed um, on federalism. I, I don't know that he would have been as disappointed. Um, you know, O'Connor was very strong on federalism. Um, you know, even resurrecting the 10th Amendment <laughs> of the Constitution, which had been you know resigned to the ash heap um, by the court. Uh, she was very strong on the death penalty, or at least early on, um, and then backed off of that uh, somewhat. Uh, she was very strong on uh, criminal procedure uh, of trying to terminate uh, criminal appeals at the state level and not allow as many of them to go to the federal level. Um, so there was a, a lot of things that she did end up on the conservative side of things um, that would have been pleasing. But um, there is, I think, an implicit understanding that the issue was abortion. Um, that was that was ultimately the litmus test. And on that one, yeah, I, I think, you know, she ends up coming up short for Reagan and, and the conservatives. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. So um, I, I, this reminds me of something that came up earlier. So I'm sorry for backtracking a little bit. But both of you have mentioned that the, you're, you're waiting for the, 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 her files to be released. So can you say something about that? I didn't know much about this. And uh, Nicole asked when, these, when uh, the O'Connor Scalia files are expected to be open. Do they keep those, do they keep those uh, private for a while? Or? Yeah, it depends on each justice. Uh, so I don't know when they will be open, but, and they can you know, set their own policy on that. Historically, I think the, the policy has been that the files won't be open until every person that they served with is deceased um, or off the court. But there have been changes. Some some have not followed that. For example, for instance, Harry Blackman's files were opened up earlier than that. And it created it, 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 there was some controversy because they were mm -hmm. they were still that was in I, around 2001 or 2002. I think his his archives files were, were opened up. So there's still lots of people that he served with. Uh, who who are who are on the court, and there was you know there's there some inside stories that 
uh, then became publicized uh. as, as, as a result. And so most justices have not done what Blackman did, which is, and I can't remember what, what rule he established uh, for, for, his, uh, for his files opening up, but it was, it was before everyone that he served with uh, was no longer on the court or had been deceased. So I don't, I don't, I don't know what, what they've decided. Yeah, my, my understanding was that, uh, I mean, the Blackman thing was a big deal. It was a big deal to O'Connor because she felt mm -hmm. personally embarrassed um, by some of the things that were, in, because Blackman was apparently a pack rat um, and kept like every scrap of paper that came his way when he was on the court. So if they were on the bench during oral arguments and somebody passed him a note, he saved it. And it went into, and I mean, obviously those things were never meant to have been public. I mean, those are private communications between the justices. Blackman, for whatever reason, saved them all for posterity. And, you know, I think there was an expectation that a reasonable amount of time was going to elapse uh, before that information would be made public. I know that Rehnquist and O'Connor, when Brennan was talking about making his records public, went to him and tried to convince him to hold off on opening up his records. And he did eventually um, uh, concede and put some sort of delay on the amount of time before his records would be fully opened up. But as far as I understand it, there's no hard and fast rule on the court right now about when the records are made available to the public. Um, and, you know, it, it, a, a lot of this, I think, was also uh, brought up about the publication of the Brethren. Uh, which showed a lot of the inner workings of the Supreme Court that technically we're not supposed to know about um, and revealed the court to be a much more political and animated institution than, you know, is maybe they, they try to portray it to be. Uh, so the justices were all, I think, somewhat unhappy with their law clerks for speaking uh, to the authors of the book. Uh, they were unhappy that other justices had clearly um, spoken to the, to the writers, even though they denied it. Um, and this would just be another way of gaining insight, you know, into the inner workings of the court, which, you know, for lack of a better word, I think the justices have an interest in keeping somewhat mysterious. Um, and uh, so I, I think for that reason, they're maybe still trying to work towards some sort of a compromise on you know, when, when we can keep these records or how long they should stay sealed. Do they, so the reason for keeping these secret is, uh, is it, it's a, to encourage sort of free and open deliberation, at least on some things. Uh, is, that, is that the idea behind this? Is it, I mean, is it tied to the idea that the judiciary should be independent and therefore, uh, you know, as they deliberate these things, they should be able to think or say anything, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, or is it just to avoid the, uh, 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 you know, uh, embarrassing things that might tarnish the reputation of the court? <laughs> so some of it is they do just want to protect the, uh, um, I think, the respects that people have for the court. And so rightly or wrongly, I think you could say what the Brethren showed uh, was that in many cases wrongly, <laughs> the public views the Supreme Court as this apolitical institution. Uh, where all of the tawdry stuff that you see going on across the street in Congress isn't happening, right? These are just people sitting there deliberate, deliberating as objectively as they can about what the rule should be, what the law should say, what the Constitution actually means. And then you read the Brethren and you see, well, man, there's a lot of, there's a lot of horse trading going on. <laughs> there's a lot of arm twisting. Um, and it minimizes, it reduces, I think, the respect uh, in the eyes of the public uh, for, uh, for, you know, for, for the court. Uh, and so I think all the justices, whether on the right or on the left or in the middle, have a vested interest in maintaining this, um, you could call it a veneer of, uh, of being apolitical uh, because of what it does for the, the power of the, the Supreme Court. Yeah, thanks, Josh. That's really interesting. And so Stacy actually asked kind of a follow up to that. Stacy Moses, our old friend, longtime friend. Uh, <laughs> is this the reason that uh, justices seem less concerned about being seen as political these days? Or is it, does that, has that contributed to it somehow? Um, yeah, I think if you were to ask the justices, they would, they would say that they, they aren't uh, less concerned about being seen as political. 
I think what you could say is that in some cases they actually have been more political than some justices on uh, in the past, <laughs> um, even though they might not. Say. So, for instance, uh, Ginsburg and her very public criticisms of Trump. I mean, this really was a significant departure from uh, the norm. All right, that you don't <laughs> level those kinds of those kinds of public criticism and. It, it, you know, the, the justices themselves get to decide when they recuse uh, themselves from, from cases. But under the historical practice, I think that some of those public comments could have been, you could say, well, that, that should have required any rec recusal on cases invo invo involving Trump. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't know that they, they would personally say that they uh, think it's less important to be seen as apolitical, but they might have just let the guard down a bit. Uh, more more recently. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate that. Um, so maybe one more question, and I'd like to get your thoughts on the opinions that we asked people to take a look at for today. So this is from Tiffany. Uh, can you say something about her relationship with Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Uh, as far as I know, the relationship was very good. Um, uh, Ginsburg, at least, uh, said that O'Connor was a mentor for her. Uh, really helped her when she first came onto the court, showing her the ins and outs of, of how the court operated and the institutional norms uh, that she had to acclimate herself to, um, that she was kind of like a big sister to her um, uh, when, when she first came onto the court. And, you know, again, this is sort of tying into what's so special about O'Connor. I mean, O'Connor had to navigate those waters by herself. I mean, there was, there was no precedent for it at that point. I mean, she had to figure out all of these things, you know, completely alone. And, you know, Ginsburg really had her to rely on in helping guide her and figuring out, you know, how to, how to do all of these different kinds of things. So I think one of the, the things about their relationship is it made Ginsburg's transition onto the court much easier um, and much more seamless. Uh, and she was able to, you know, go into her role as a judge, uh, you know, much more quickly uh, than, you know, probably took O'Connor to figure out what was going on and, and what she needed to be doing. Um, Ginsburg, of course, already had previous judicial experience, which O'Connor barely had um, when she had, had gone on the court, uh, which I, I think also gave Ginsburg a leg up um, when, she, when she was elevated to the uh, Supreme Court. Um, but as far as I know, uh, the, the two of them got along really well. I mean, they were not on the same page politically. Uh, they were certainly not on the same page ideologically. But, you know, sometimes O'Connor was in, you know, was, was on one side. Um, sometimes she was on the other. But she wasn't, I mean, Ginsburg was a much more ideological judge. Uh, you know, that wasn't O'Connor. So that was certainly a divide between them. But I don't think it affected their personal relationship very much. And that's one of the things, you know, that is kind of remarkable about the court as, as opposed to like Congress, where the political battles of the last decade have led to this gap between members of different parties or, you know, different people of ideological extremes where they can't even talk to one another. They can't even associate with one another. Whereas on the court, you know, they seem to enjoy pretty good relationships. So you think about Scalia and Ginsburg, who couldn't be farther apart <laughs> ideologically. I mean, you know, these, these folks are on polar opposite extremes on just about everything and yet are very, very close friends um, and are going to the opera together or spending Christmas together, you know, all, all these different kinds of things that are going on between them. And, you know, that's, that's the kind of relationships that the court allows them to build. So there's actually a story about when the Supreme Court decided U.S. versus Virginia, the, v, the VMI case, Virginia Military Institute case, where you know VMI had been an all-male institution, it had been challenged as a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. The Supreme Court said that uh, it was, and they had to make it available to uh, female uh, students as well. And Justice Ginsburg wrote the majority opinion uh, for the for the Supreme Court, and in several n n articles written about. When, when the court decide, uh, announced the decision, you know, the, uh, the Justice Ginsburg read part of the decision fr from the bench. And then I, a few times as she was reading, reading the decision, she would look over to Justice O'Connor uh, and then they would like exchange a smile or a nod with each other, <laughs> kind of indicating their, you know, the, the, 
their agreement on these issues and the import, importance of it to, uh, to both of them. Uh, so that was my understanding as well, is that they got along quite, uh, quite well. Uh, and yeah, they did disagree. Uh, um, I would say probably more often than not, but not always as the, uh, as the VMI case uh, illustrates. That's fascinating. Thanks very much. And so, so speaking of the, of the, the VMI case, so <clears throat> we um, recommended four opinions from Justice O'Connor today, and you, you you selected those as somehow you know representing perhaps something important about her judicial thought. So there's a case on uh, affirmative action, right? There's a case on uh, there's a religious establishment case, and then there are two cases on the takings clause. So uh, could you guys just sort of help us? Um, Think through some of these op opinions and uh, and what we should take from them and what they tell us about Justice O'Connor and her not just how she her, not her judicial thought but her impact on the court perhaps. I mean, I'm not asking sure, you to walk yeah, through yeah. all of so them. I'll, 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 them. I'll, <laughs> so I think that her opinion uh, on affirmative the affirmative action that was the first time the Supreme Court had reconsidered affirmative action in higher education since Bakke. Uh, and as people had started to recognize, people had treated uh, Justice Powell's opinion in, in Bakke as if, as if the, the Supreme Court had agreed with it. And then, uh, then people realized, well, no, the, a majority of the Supreme Court has never actually signed on to, to what Justice Powell said in the Bakke decision, what, which was that diversity could be a, uh, a compelling government interest in making a r racial classification. And so it goes to the Supreme Court, and of course they strike down the uh, the admissions program for on the undergraduate side. But then, importantly, uh, they uphold the admissions program on for for the law school uh, because and O'Connor ends up writing the majority decision and uh, saying that diversity can be a comp can can be a compelling government and in, uh, government interest. Uh, but she points out that what. For her, what makes it different is that each applicant got an individualized treatment. Uh, each application, so they weren't treated in the kind of numerical or quantitative way that uh, on the undergraduate side they had. Uh, but then you also see her her un how uncomfortable she is with it as well, because she's the one who puts in this, well, there should be a, almost like a 25 year sunset provision right, to, to this opinion, because there's, not, there, there's nothing that actually dicta dic dictates that that will be the case, right? We're gonna actually be, when, when will that be? Uh, 20, another what, eight years or so, something like that will be a 20, uh, 20, 25 years. Uh, so it's not like it does come with a, this, this uh, precedent expires right after 20 years, but it's basically, that's what, that's what she hopes. Um, so that ends up being ex extreme, extremely significant. Um, you know, the, her, her concurrence in Lynch versus Donnelly, I think is important because it does, a, she creates this kind of endorsement test. Uh, now the Supreme Court's establishment clause jurisprudence is still just a mess. Like no one <laughs> knows exactly what to make of it. This was her attempt, right, to, to, to provide a test that might actually work. Uh, and it was adopted in other cases. Um, and then I'll, I won't say much about this because we can get into the details, but the, the comparison of Hawaii Housing Authority uh, versus the Kelo decision shows her on the one side saying that taking private property and transferring it to another private owner is okay. Hawaii Housing Authority versus Midkiff, but Kelo, it's, it's, uh, you can't do it. And you, you also see this in other issues where, where she initially, say in Bowers versus Hardwick, she, she sided uh, with Georgia uh, upholding their their law, saying that there you know couldn't be non procreative uh, sexual acts, but then she votes uh, against Texas and Lawrence versus Texas, but comes up with a kind of interesting way of saying that it's still consistent. And it's difficult to, you know, you you have to s decide for yourself if she was actually being consistent or if she just changed her mind. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a tough thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Right? So I mean, it's uh, you know, did she change her mind in terms of maybe as a matter of principle, or, or would she say, in the, at least in the the, uh, the takings cases, are the circumstances different? Does that allow her to say under, you know, there's one sort of rule, mm -hmm. one general principle under these circumstances, yes, it is okay. Under these circumstances, no. Or is that a way to perhaps argue that you she's you can try? And she tries to do that in in her dissent in Kilo. 
Uh, I'll tell you, I'm not persuaded by it. I don't see that there's actually a <laughs> general rule that allows you to say that, okay, it's, the, the, here, here's what I saw. I, I mean, when I, so when I read it, what, what in Hawaii Housing Authority versus Midkiff, the, the people who were having land taken uh, from them were, were very wealthy. <laughs> that was the, that was the uh -huh. issue. In Kilo, in Kilo, this is a, you know, lower middle class, you know, uh, woman in a uh, neighborhood. And I think it's difficult to say that that's not what was driving dri driving her her, her decision, because um, I think it's difficult to establish a kind of clear rule when you look at those when when you look at those those two two opinions. Um, I I don't know what would I mean how you know what you know, what, what would it actually be um, I don't think but I, I think she changed her mind is what happened. And she still tried to say that you could uh, reconcile the two opinions, but I, I don't know that you can. The Kilo decision is so, well, just it just made a mess of things, right? <laughs> yeah. As a result yeah. of the lack of a kind of clear rule in terms of consistency. But yeah. Eric, you wanted to jump in. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Uh, yeah, no, I would just say, I, to me, if, if, you're, if you're looking at O'Connor in a microcosm, the Gratz and Gruder decisions are, are perfect for trying to wrestle with her jurisprudence and uh, you know, trying to get your head wrapped around how she approaches you know, these legal questions. I mean, she doesn't write the opinion in Gratz, but she certainly signs on with it. And then in Gruder, you know, I guess the question is how much has really changed um, in Gruder from Gratz? And she says, well, a lot, because we have these individualized um, considerations that are you know, coming into play when it comes to considering these, these candidates. Um, and then she has that line about how you know, when it comes to the compelling state interest being a, a diversified student body, you know, we're going to rely on the law school um, as the basis for confirming that, which is kind of like asking the fox if he has a compelling reason for being in the 10 house. I, I mean, of, of course, they're going to say they have a compelling reason to, <laughs> to be doing that. You know, it's, it's for the court to be skeptical of, of that claim. And to bring it in, you know, a, a separate, you know, uh, a level of analysis to, to what they're doing. So, you know, you, you get the sense she is kind of bending over backwards, trying to make this work and not wanting to give in to the conservative side of the court who wants to strike down racial preferences entirely. Mm -hmm. um, that she does seem to have this, this, you know, sensibility about her that we're not quite at the point where we can get rid of all racial preferences you know, they need to continue for at least some period of time longer. You know, we have not reached a full racial reconciliation in the country. So we need to, again, move forward incrementally. Um, and so we're going to allow these things to continue for some unspecified period of time, maybe 25 years, uh, may maybe longer. Um, and then you have like, you know, the, the Kennedys in dissent who are just irate about this and saying, you know, look, every single year, the percentage of minority students that are coming in are almost identical to the percentage of the applications that are coming in. This is a quota system. This is obviously a quota system. They can dress it up any way they want to, but, you know, it's very clear what they're doing here. And I think Kennedy's got a strong point on that. <laughs> I, I think he makes a very compelling argument, but O'Connor really does seem, you know, very, very intent on trying to save this, um, again, at least temporarily. That's fascinating. So um, you both mentioned that she is, uh, she didn't come in with a lot of judicial experience, but she established her, I mean, when she was on the court, clearly she was a a strong presence and had a lot of influence on on other justices. Um, there were a number of questions, a couple of questions that came in asking about her, her influence in terms of setting, you know, precedent, if you want to call it that, I may not be using the right term, that have influenced future court decisions. So can, can you think of some uh, ways in which she has influenced the way the courts have thought or decided on, on these questions um, after O'Connor stepped down from the bench? Well, I think you can say that some of her decisions, of course, have precedential power. Uh, but again, it's difficult to articulate what what the uh, ju uh, jurisprudential philosophy is right, that is motivating them that then others could uh, could build on. As, as Eric mentioned, she she tried to resurrect the Tenth Amendment, <laughs> um, never got very far with it. I don't think she you know couldn't 
couldn't get other justices. And I think it's just given the nature of the 10th Amendment, it's really difficult to actually build a, a, a substantive <laughs> yeah. uh, kind of um, constitutional jurisprudence on, on, on the 10th Amendment. Um, yeah, we've already met. So we, yeah, the, the Lynch versus Donnelly concurrence, that was important. But, uh, the endorsement test is still kind of out there. Right. Again, we don't know exactly what the court's approach towards the Establishment Clause is right now. Um, but I will tell you that people still think there's something like an endorsement test there. So you know, the, for a long time, the court was guided, at least in some cases, by the Lemon test. Uh, the court apparently finally killed off maybe right, the Lemon test um, in the, uh, uh, the, the case out of, out of Maryland, the American Legion versus American Humanist Association. So after that, people still weren't left with well, so what is what is the what is the standard? So I know in talking to people who are actually involved in litigation uh, that they still think that there might be something like an endorsement test that's operative among the justices. Um, and again, that that's kind of a O'Connor, right? Um, you could think about joining, you know, the Planned Parenthood versus Casey decision. And again, that's not a decision that's going to give you any clear statement of judicial philosophy. And if you actually read the decision. You know, the, we don't know who wrote which parts. We do know who wrote s some parts of it, right? We know the parts that Kennedy wrote, um, and uh, um, they're de dead giveaways, right? But um, that was more, if you read it, it's like, well, we aren't even certain that Roe was properly decided. <laughs> That's all, you can kind of see that in the opinion, but um, there's too much water under the bridge, right? Um, there are reliance interests. Uh, and so then that, of course, ha has the effect of buttressing, even though they got rid of the trimester system, created the undue burden standard, um, that still ends up just basically sustaining Roe. Right? Uh, and so without Planned Parenthood versus Casey, I think there would have been more of a chance that Roe gets overturned. Um, so I, I, that's, that's, that's how I think about it. Again, I, I don't know that people are going to read, read many of her decisions 50 years from now. Um, and say, all right, this is a, a clear announcement of uh, of a constitutional rule that then guided future uh, you know fu future courts. Uh, instead, again, there were kind of prudential or pragmatic judgments, I think, on her part that were uh, that that really drove drove her decision making. Except maybe with the exception of federalism, which seemed to be you know a dear principle for her. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you, Josh. So. Uh... Two more uh, questions here. Uh, we have a number of questions, actually. Let me start with this one. So backtracking just a little bit to the Michigan cases. So Marion asked, do you guys have any information about any behind the scenes action with regard to how the Michigan cases were decided uh, involving O'Connor? I guess, but I, I don't, yeah, I don't know, yeah, or something like that. I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's not that uncommon to see the court split on these kind of com, on these companion cases. Uh, yeah, after all, you see it on the Ten Commandments, <laughs> the uh, McCreary County case uh, versus ACLU out of Kentucky, and then the, the case out of Texas, right? And one, the court says, well, Ten Commandments are okay, and the other, it's not okay. Right? Justice Breyer switched right between the two, and they're decided simultaneously. So it, it's not that strange to see uh, justices say one is not okay, right, as, as O'Connor did with the, uh, with the undergraduate program in Graz, but then said that it's fine with the law school because of this individualized consideration she did in Grutter. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I, Boy, this is a tough, boy, you guys are getting some tough questions today. You're doing great. Uh, <laughs> so I'm a little hesitant to ask this, but Lynn asked a couple of times about, uh, can you think of whether her, if, if she had continued to serve, uh, let's say another five years instead of stepping down from the bench, could she have had an impact on any important cases in that time? I'm just coming up with say five years or something like that. So Lynn actually asked, what would her, what would her, what would her continued service as justice would have would it have impacted any Supreme Court decision? That is a tough question. I know I'm putting you guys right. Yeah. On. So I'm trying to think of the big ones that were decided. Right? So basically, you wouldn't have had Alito, right? Um, oh, yeah, that's right. right. Uh, although, you know, given I, it does sound like the you know her 
there were these family considerations. I'm not certain how much longer uh, she would have would have continued to serve. Um, but uh, you know, maybe Citizens United. I don't know. Maybe, I, I, although I, I suspect she probably would have voted the same way um, as the rest of the as the you know it was a, it was a bare majority is five to four. Again, with Kennedy writing the opinion for the court, I, I, I suspect she might have voted uh, with, with, uh, with Kennedy on that one and the conservative bloc. Um, I'm going to have to think about some of the other important cases during that, say, yeah, because I do think there were pro probably four to five years is, is what you would have, she probably could have served uh, if she hadn't stepped down when, when, when she did, so. Yeah, and that was, I mean, you have to remember she, her husband, he, he's an interesting part of her story. Um, he gave up a lucrative position in a law practice in Arizona to follow her to Washington when she got appointed to the Supreme Court. And he couldn't get work after she was appointed because it would have been a conflict of interest. Um, so he effectively took over raising the kids, uh, handling the domestic duties and uh, basically followed her around as she went to different speaking engagements. And you know, they, they went skiing every year um, out, I think it was Colorado, in fact, um, they, they went to, uh, uh, to, to go skiing. Um, so, I mean, they went overseas. So, I mean, you know, it, it, I'm not gonna say it was a hard life for him, but um, you know, he, he did give up a lot um, for her career. Uh, and when he got Alzheimer's and was rapidly declining, I think she saw it as incumbent upon her uh, to, uh, uh, to resign from the court and take care of him uh, in his dying years um, and uh, maybe just have some time to herself. I mean, this is a woman who was on the go nonstop her entire life. Uh, and I think maybe she wanted some time to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and enjoy things a little bit. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, 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 it's a good question. I mean, what would have happened? I can't come up with anything other than Citizens United as being, you know, a major case in the next five years. And I'm with Josh. I really am not sure that O'Connor would have sided differently than the majority did in that case. Um, but, uh, you know, for, for what was going on in the country and for what was going on overall, I, I think it was probably the right time for her to stop, step down. Uh, if she wanted to have, you know, a, a little bit of a, of, of a say in, in, you know, getting a predecessor on the court, or not a predecessor, a successor on the court. Yeah, again, I know that was a big question, but you guys handled it very thoughtfully. And, it, it, you know, maybe the, the suggestion for those joining us who want to pursue this further is to do exactly as uh, Eric and Josh were suggesting. Go look at the cases that were decided in the next few years and, and take a look at how Alito decides and, you know, maybe try to substitute O'Connor's own thinking. Uh, but yeah, that's a very thoughtfully done. Um, so, so speaking of O'Connor, Justice O'Connor stepping down, um, uh, Kim, uh, Kimberly uh, uh, Huffman asks uh, whether uh, O'Connor had any input uh, on her replacement. Is that, do justices, when they step down, do they have any influence on who might replace them? Well, the biggest, influence, the biggest influence they have is the timing of it, right? If they can, um, it, 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 we do know that there are some justices who want to want to make certain that someone who is more uh, ideologically congenial to them is uh, in the presidency. And I think that that was probably important to O'Connor. Um, that, that, that was my sense. Eric, Eric alluded to that. I think that that was, I, I do think that was important to her. Um, as far as the replacements, right? Sometimes we do know of justices saying, "All right, here are some of my former clerks." Right. Uh, so, for instance, I, th I think there's pretty good evidence that Kennedy uh, sent a, a list of people that he would like the the Trump administration to consider for his replacement. Of course, Kavanaugh ended up being, uh, you know, one of, you know was was one of his one of his uh, one of his clerks. Um, so. There, that does happen. Uh, that that does that does happen. But I don't. I've never heard anything in particular about her saying, "Well, these are the people that I would like to see considered uh, for my uh, replacement." Uh, and in fact, right, wasn't Roberts? Roberts was, I think, initially her replacement. But then Rehnquist ended up passing away. Yeah. Uh, and then 
Bush pushed uh, Roberts forward to be chief justice. And so then Alito came in uh, as O'Connor, O'Connor's replacement. So, although that's interesting, it could, because John Roberts did have significant respects among all the justices on the, on the Supreme Court. You know, he was known as one of the greatest oral advocates before the court of you know, maybe the last 50 years. Uh, uh, there were justices on the left, right? Ginsburg, I remember her, she was asked, like, who, who do you always enjoy uh, seeing at oral arguments as an attorney? And she, John Roberts, right? So, you know, that, that, could have been, that could have been the case, at least initially. Great, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, let's take one more question. And then there are a number of questions having to do with, you know, things that you recommend uh, as far as reading uh, on Justice O'Connor. But here's a question from Kathleen. Uh, can you address O'Connor's regret over siding with Bush, uh, in siding with Bush over Gore in the 2000 election case? Did she regret? I'm not sure where the source was. Well, it. yeah, I think all of them regretted uh, the decision. I think that they felt that they, the, the ones in the majority felt that they didn't have much of a choice. <laughs> that, was the, uh, that was the issue. I don't think any of them are going to look to Bush versus Gore as a, as, as a shining example of constitutional decision making. I think they regret that they felt that they were put in that position, primarily by the Florida Supreme Court. I mean, I think there, there was clear, I mean, you go back and read uh, Bush versus Gore decision, there's, there's no small amount of, um, I think, consternation at what had happened in the, in the Florida courts. Uh, and so then there was a division, of course, about what, what, to do, uh, what to do about it. And so I think many of them, I, I, again, I don't know a single one uh, the five who, who said stop the recount, but then there were, of course, seven who said that what Florida was doing was unconstitutional. I don't think there are any of them who, said, who, who actually liked the fact that they, that they intervened. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree with that entirely. I, I, I have not read anywhere or seen anything to suggest that O'Connor herself felt regret um that she sided with the majority in that case but um it was it was not a good day for the court and i mean you got to remember even if they had sided the other way it still wouldn't have been a good day for the court um it didn't really matter which way they sided in that case half of america was going to be upset with them and that's exactly the reason why it was put you know the the court i think was upset as josh said about being put in that position uh, of having to, you know, resolve uh, a, a national election uh, based on a decision that, that they had to make. And that's never a position the court wants to find itself in um, at all. But, you know, ultimately it was their decision and, and they made it. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't, I never got a sense that she looked back on it and said, oh, I wish I had voted the other way. I don't, I don't think she ever regretted the way she voted. I think she just regretted that um, the vote had to be taken at all. Well, thank you for that clarification. That's very well put. That makes a lot of sense. So, um, <laughs> Stacy, <laughs> with another follow up on this, is that possibly the reason why the court did not want to get involved in the 2020 election? I'm, I'm assuming she's well, she's yeah. I mean, I don't, season. yeah, I think the court in general just doesn't like to get involved in <laughs> resolve, resolving <laughs> elections. I think the big difference is that you know Florida was it was extremely close, right? Um, Gore was within striking distance, right? He could taste it, and so he just needed to find a you know a few hundred votes um, where that wasn't the case, uh, you know, in 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 2020, right? I mean, there you know there are accusations of ir irregularity, and even if there was uh, uh, evidence that there was uh, something amiss, I, you know, I think that for the court there was. There wasn't a, 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 uh, evidence that it would have been decisive in the outcome, right? So, uh, yeah, the court the court doesn't want to be reliving um, the 2000 election, that's for sure. Uh, and this, yeah, to what happened in 2020 wasn't, you know, there there would have had to have been more action at the lower court level uh, for them to say, oh yeah, let's 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 uh, let, you know let's get involved. Now, of course, there were controversies over you know, and I think this will be ongoing, right? The controversies over Say Pennsylvania's election laws being changed by state courts uh, pri prior to the election—that's going to be an ongoing issue and, and concern. 
because also the, the you know, court, courts don't like having other courts um, change change law in that way. That's not the role of that's not the role of courts. So that might be something that uh, it's going to that's going to come up. But may, and maybe to Stacey's question, it it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if Bush versus Gore was kind of looming in the backs of the minds of some of the justices when they're voting on those challenges to the P Pennsylvania changes in their election law. Um, that may we, we'll just hold off. Um. And very judiciously answered, Josh. <laughs> it was a very judicious answer. All right, all right. That was good. I got it. Yeah. So, so uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you both very much. This has been very insightful and uh, coming away with a greater appreciation of Justice O'Connor than I had before. I did, I did, uh, I did uh, appreciate her, but my appreciation is even deeper now. So just maybe in our last minute or two, can you recommend to uh, people joining us some further reading, some books on O'Connor or by uh, O'Connor? Uh, there were a number of, um, uh, in the question, somebody mentioned Evan Thomas's recent biography. Do you have any recommendations for things to read or maybe other opinions? Yeah, yeah so I haven't, um... I haven't read Evan Thomas's uh, uh, biogra biography of her, so I'm, I'm actually I'm going to I'll go, you know, you know, go, go take a look at it. There is a book that I think helps capture some of the controversy going on on the court better than than other books uh, dur during a, a significant part of her tenure. It was called Supreme Conflict mm -hmm. by Jan Crawford uh, Greenberg. And it was kind of like the Brethren, but for the Rehnquist Court. <laughs> um, and so that actually, I think that's insightful just to get a sense of the dynamics on the court. It does better, it's still difficult given that, you know, justices don't like to talk to journalists. They, you know, tell their clerks that they can't talk to anyone, right? Swear them to secrecy. So it, but I think it does better than anyone else. It's, it's journalistic, but it, I think it's good and interesting, a lot of uh, fascinating material. So I, I, I would recommend that. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that very much. Eric, any uh, recommendations? Or? Yeah, uh, Joan, I'm going to mispronounce her last name. I think it's Biskupic, uh, has a biography of O'Connor. It's just <laughs> called Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, it's got a colon after it. I don't remember what it is, um, but the, the main title is Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, she does a pretty good job um, of capturing her. O'Connor did not participate in many of the biographies that were written about her. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't actually know the reason for it. Uh, I, I don't know whether she was worried she was going to get miscast or <laughs> uh, just didn't want to be bothered with the, uh, the process of, of, of book writing. But um, she, uh, uh, Joan does a really good job of digging into court archives and interviews with other justices and clerks and all of those kinds of things uh, to put together a pretty compelling portrait um, of her that, that deals a lot with her opinions as well. Um, and then I think Kathy had mentioned it. Uh, she O'Connor has a memoir called Lazy Bee, uh, which is basically an account of her time on the ranch growing up and then the history of her ranch mm -hmm. uh, where she grew up. I mean, it has nothing to do with the law, but it gives you some insight into her character and how she grew up and, you know, maybe where some of her, her thinking originated uh, from, from the environment she found herself in. Um, and then, uh, of course, the book she wrote, which is not what I would call a great gift to uh, literature, um, but is, is still a pretty good read, The, uh, the Majesty of the Law uh, that uh, O'Connor wrote. And it's kind of a nice short history of the court and gives some nice insights into how the court operates and uh, those kinds of things. So, I mean, those are, those are good sources you can go to. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, this has been a, a real pleasure and, and really informative and I appreciate uh, your thoughts and your time this morning, Eric and Josh. Um, look forward to hopefully doing this again sometime. So thank you both very much. Thank you, thank you. enjoyed it, yep. It was fun. And thanks to everybody who joined us today and submitted questions. We had some great questions, some tough questions. Just a reminder, again, that you'll receive an email with the link that you can request your certificate of participation through. If you've enjoyed our conversation today, look into the other resources that Ashbrook uh, provides through TAH.org and help us spread the word about uh, these webinars and our other resources by sharing uh, links and, and other things on social media and email and other things. So 
Our next Saturday webinar series will begin in August. And until then, please take care, and I hope to see you all then. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our free programs, resources, and our documents collection for teachers, students, and citizens at Teaching American History or TAH.org.